In 2020, the world was hit by COVID-19, the worst pandemic since 1920. Borders were closed, and life as we knew it immediately shuddered to a stop. Only essential workers like doctors, nurses, grocery staff, and individuals supporting the supply chain were allowed to continue working. This documentary is about the non-essentials, those who were confined to their homes for months. What is the impact of labeling us as essential and non-essential? Are these the right terms for describing humans? I think the term, I get it, right? I get why we need this category of essential and non-essential workers. The governments are trying to do their best to reduce the number of people out in public. They're trying to sort of create some kind of social order to make sure the society continues to function while keeping us safe. But the term essential is also the, uh, the irony of the term really connotes that on one hand, the people who are really the foundation of society, right? Like the people at the grocery stores, people who are cleaners and nurses and, you know, the, the fundamentals like delivery people are also the least paid, have the most precarious situations. And the fact is, our uh, societies are built on them. They are the foundation, right? So in a sense, we stand upon these people and I think it would be really worth for us, you know, in a sense, as we go through this, to think about it as how essential workers does not mean necessarily that they are the most valued workers. Um, none of us wants the sort of mean existence of just, you know, uh, you know, uh, waking and eating and, and that sort of thing. So, um, but I do think that the language of, of people being more or less essential is worrisome because, again, I think it reduces us, right, to um, our productive capacities, right? What do we produce? Who are you, right? Well, you are what you produce. Well, that seems to me clearly wrong, right? Ethically speaking, morally speaking, we matter much more than just in terms of you know, how we contribute economically or productively to the wider world. I think people who are non-essential are, they are very, you know, they feel in many ways grateful you know, to feel like I feel so grateful that I don't have to go and leave my house. Mm. I can't imagine what it's like to be an essential worker. I can't imagine what it's like to keep having to leave your house every day and put yourself in danger. And um, I mean, the other big issue is, right, there are a lot of essential workers who maybe they're, you know, for them, they have to go to work because they're essential, but there's a lot of people out there that are still working because financially they don't have a choice. Most non-essentials now work from home. Is working in a home office the way of the future? What about the work-life balance? Will the remote work experience be different from what people imagined? I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding of what it means to work from home from a corporate perspective. Um, I think the, the greatest impact is going to be on people's health and, and well-being on the work from home. And, and why I say that is during this time where it's five days a week or four days a week that you're working from home, I really would guess that most people were not set up properly to be working from home. Um, the impact on health is going to be things like, um, I know I was on a Zoom call with someone and he could barely move his neck. Why? because he just spent the last five weeks looking at a screen. Whereas in an office setting, um, you have more opportunity to walk around, move around maybe, and, and people haven't really been pacing themselves either. Um, you know, for fear of, you know, if, if I'm not meeting the expectations, fear of losing your job, fear of being, um, you know, your employer saying, well, you know, we're going to furlough you and, and so we don't need you anymore. Everyone's living in fear of, of that happening. So they, I think there is a tendency for people to overdo it and not balance themselves. You know, know when to shut it off. Jetzt beginnen manche Unternehmen zu lernen, 
dass man auch im Homeoffice die Beschäftigten arbeiten lassen kann, dass man vor dem Kontrollverlust gar nicht so Angst haben muss. Und manche Beschäftigte merken aber auch, dass Homeoffice zum Teil gar nicht so einfach ist, wie man sich das vorstellt. Also man hat immer, ich weiß gar nicht, ob sich das durch Corona so geändert hat, aber vor Corona hat man immer so Hochglanzbroschüren gehabt. Da sitzt ein Mensch zu Hause am Laptop und daneben spielt das Kind oder man hat das Kind auf dem Schoß und das hat auch so ein bisschen auf die Tasten. Das ist ja genau das, was man nicht haben will im Homeoffice. Also man will im Homeoffice in der Regel in Ruhe arbeiten können. Working from home isn't, you know, I think it used to feel like the ultimate thing, like the opportunity to be able to work from home. And it's a really nice freedom. And it's one, because my clients work in the tech industry, it's something that they've all been able to enjoy and be able to do. But I do think that the long-term effects of working from home is it makes it impossible. Like we were already struggling with technology to create boundaries for ourselves. So now there's not even the boundary of an office. There's not even that boundary, right? Because even for my clients who I would work with them on creating a better boundary between um, home and work, like I would even work with them in terms of like, what time do you leave the office and how many times do you check email and all of that. But now it's like, there is no time, you know, there's no point at which they're leaving the office. There's no point at which it's all going away. And it is, it's incredibly hard to, I have it too, where you're sitting on the couch trying to relax and there's your desk. Like there's your laptop, there's everything, or you're living in a teeny tiny little place and everything's in one room. I think what people are finding is, is that it's hard to shut things off, but people are also really struggling with being productive because there are so many distractions during the day. Leute mit Kindern äh, sind manchmal durchaus froh unter normalen Bedingungen, wenn sie im Büro arbeiten können dann haben sie mal definierte Ruhezeiten von der Familie im Büro und können dort konzentrierter arbeiten als zu Hause. Aber diese völlige Durchmischung beider Lebensbereiche, also Multitasking zwischen Büro und Kinderbetreuung, das ist ziemlich belastend für die Beschäftigten. Und das ist, glaube ich, auch nicht das Ideal für die Zukunft. Forced into immediate prolonged confinement, initially without a timeline, the struggle with anxiety and loneliness has affected all of us. We look to explore the psychological impact of COVID-19 on the world's non-essentials. We're all going through a shared trauma. We're all experiencing some level of anxiety. So anxiety and trauma on the body over time, I mean, there's many, many studies that have been done about this, about the effects of trauma over time and, and how you know, someone who has been exposed to ongoing anxiety, um, you know, what happens is, is that it does affect them in the future. It makes them more anxious. Things that normally wouldn't make them anxious suddenly makes them really anxious. Uh, so, I mean, as a collective whole, we as a nation, you know, all over the world, we are all struggling with low grade, low grade anxiety. And there is a tremendous amount of uncertainty um, in the world. You know, we don't know exactly what this is all going to look like. There's a tremendous amount of what's going on right now that's out of our control. And so anxiety is essentially about control or the lack of control. So we don't feel in control. On the one hand, it is probably the case that some people will uh, experience the pandemic as, as kind of a personal crisis of different kinds. Um, those who already had pre-existing uh, mental illnesses uh, may find this particularly challenging time because some of the support networks that are ordinarily available to them may not be. Some people may simply not uh, be seeking out health care because they're concerned about you know, burdening our, our medical care institutions in general. So it's interesting that um, from what I can gather, uh, suicide rates appear during the flu pandemic of 1918-1919 of to actually have diminished somewhat. Um, and it's a little hard to know why, but you know, if we, if we want to engage in a bit of informed speculation, I would say, first of all, that um, when people are uh, working less and they're in their homes and so forth, sometimes their support network, networks are going to be stronger. 
right? They're gonna be around their families more. You might have more chances for certain kinds of socializing. They might have chances for things like exercise, which we know is quite good for people's mental health. They might be able to develop new uh, hobbies, new pursuits. It seems like now everybody's a chef. <laughs> so, you know, there are some ways in which I think you could have a positive mental health effect that might counteract some of the trends I was speaking about a moment ago. Um, I think it's also worth keeping in mind that, you know, unemployment, which, you know, is, is a huge stressor, right, in most societies, right? Almost every, uh, you know, psychological study about unemployment concludes that it's not good for people's mental health. It's true that it's not good, but on the other hand, there, there's an undercurrent in that literature that points out that it takes away certain kinds of stresses that people have, right? Work is stressful. Balancing work with other kinds of commitments is stressful. So uh, I certainly, again, don't want to be um, unduly or rationally optimistic about, about the pandemic and its effect on mental health and rates of suicide, but I do think that probably it's a complicated picture with some um, forces flowing in one direction, but maybe some of the forces flowing in the opposite direction. COVID changed lives and behaviors permanently. People are being forced to deal with their problems. Companies have to work in different ways. Could this pandemic be a chance to rethink and change our future? I strongly believe that this is going to open up uh, companies, how they think about talent, how they um, go about providing leadership to those people, uh, to remote workers, because it now means that we don't have to make people move. But I think a lot of people are going to take a real hard look and make some choices about who they're going to work for. There will be. Um, you know, many, many bankruptcies and foreclosures and, you know, uh, sort of people ending up with, you know, large amounts of their wealth uh, depleted, if not eliminated, um, because of this situation. So I think it will make vivid and make very concrete for those who maybe were not as appreciative of some of the moral um, dimensions of, of economic inequality in our society. I think it'll make it very vivid and concrete to them. I think the other thing is that I want to, I, I will want to counter, right, or resist, I think, a feeling that many people have, have expressed, at least I've seen them express, that the pandemic makes them feel helpless, right? Um, you know, we've got a, a phenomenon here that, again, makes everyone vulnerable, but also, to be honest, everyone can contribute to its resolution. We weren't really being present in the present moment. We were constantly living for the gratification of Instagram and, you know, um, Pinterest and these other things that that was something I, I saw with my clients. They would attend events or go to things so that they could go and say they went out of some sort of feeling of obligation and then they could take a picture and then post it on Instagram in order to show that I have this interesting life. And it's like, well, do you like these people? Do you like even going to these events? <laughs> like, what's the point, right? Technology really changed us. You know, the internet changed us, the having social media changed us. And suddenly how we connected with people and how we interacted with people changed. And um, people had quote unquote, all of these followers and friends, but no real connections, right? We were already having an issue of loneliness. You know, we're really getting very clear on what's important and not important in our lives. You know, who do I miss and not miss during this pandemic? What things do I miss and not miss during this pandemic? And it's, I think it's really helping people get crystal clear on, you know, what's important to them, what's not important, what were the relationships that were missing, you know, all of those things. You're going to have to sit with your feelings and figure out how you get through those things. And so that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a lot of people are being challenged to deal with things differently and which can be incredibly powerful. I mean, I think for a lot of people, it allows them to hit the reset button. What I'm also seeing is a lot of people, unfortunately, are being laid off from their jobs, but they're realizing like, I don't want to do this job. Like if, if, the, if everything was going to end tomorrow, like I don't want to be, you know, I don't want this life. 
We did a lot of things wrong, but also some things right. This is not the last crisis. This is not the last time we will be scared and alone. So how can we tell future generations what we learned to prevent future events like this? I think we can learn that we need to work on building more empathy towards uh, other people who are really going through a very different kind of consequence, you know, are experiencing this crisis in a very different way because of existing uh, social situations, right? And we can see it, like initially we were so all in it together, but now we have realized that actually it's affecting certain racial populations far more, the low income groups even more, or domestic violence is on the rise. So women are much more vulnerable in these kinds of situations. And so it's, yeah, we're not on the, this whole idea that we on a, that we have reached a sort of level playing field in any way is sort of a stark reminder that we really need to work on that in a genuine way, whether it's a free market, whether it's this, you know, or the education system or any kind of public good services. I look at companies like Airbnb and uh, Uber and what their talent attraction people are now doing is taking those same skills and sharing that talent with other companies that are not as greatly affected, other industries that are not as greatly affected. Um, I think that is, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to see happen because to simply send somebody, um, you know, companies that are doing this badly, I don't think they're going to survive. Uh, I really don't. I think in five years time, we'll look back and be able to pinpoint the way they treated people when you and I realize how hard those decisions are to decide to lay somebody off, but how you did it and what you did after. I think this is going to be an amazing point in time that employers will begin to see um, how they treat their people is going to have a direct effect on their bottom line. I think one of the lessons that we should learn from a pandemic is that every human being is vulnerable. It's just really not possible. Uh, to render yourself invulnerable to this pandemic completely, totally, right? We're all vulnerable, but some people are more vulnerable than others. And, you know, there are just other sort of broader socioeconomic factors that seem to make people more vulnerable. Um, by and large, you know, uh, it seems to correlate with, with sort of how wealthy you are. You know, the less wealth you've got, the harder it is to resist some of these things. And that's, of course, just to, to focus on the uh, health dimensions of the pandemic, right? The economic vulnerability differences between people are immense, right? And I think that that vulnerability can be a source of strength and solidarity for us. We can say to future generations that we made mistakes, we learned from them, and we, you know, took that new knowledge and, and you know, improved things. Um, what else can we do, right? What other choice do we have, right? This crisis is contradictory. It is a blessing in a sense. It gives people that sort of time to think, to redesign, to, you know, maybe bond with family members. And it is also extremely devastating. It's uprooting. So it is inherently contradictory as well. Most of life is. We were able to slow down and savor the time that we have with family. Never before, certainly in three or four generations, was, was this even something we thought would be possible. The other thing was the opportunity to give and not expect anything in return. To openly give and it was certainly the biggest wave of people reaching out and giving and looking to help. So I think it's probably created opportunities that nobody would have foreseen. Things will be, things would have been invented, but we have finally had the time to think about it. It's okay to be scared. It's okay to feel overwhelmed. All of those feelings are completely, completely acceptable. 
And it's really about how you choose to think about yourself and your situation. And it, you know, do I think from a place of um, resilience and change and growth, or do I think from a place of, you know, anger and fear? And that becomes your choice in the end. attributable to human error.